Please do more of this. All right. Uh, you heard that I am substituting. I'm substituting for Belmont Union. And, and you will recognize, therefore, that I'm not an expert on migration, on West Indian or Barbadian migration to Panama. That's, I have not studied it, I have read about it. But I believe that since in fact I'm a teacher and I've been a teacher for a rather long time as you are hearing, I can make myself understand most things. And I also believe that if I understand, I can make other people understand. So I hope therefore that this is borne out today when I talk to you. So let me therefore say something about I call it Barbadian migration to Panama. And I'm not going to go to the wider thing, but there will be references to the wider migration from the Caribbean to the Isthmus. And I'm going to, what I have to say will revolve around a number of things. And I should let me pause to say that this is a large subject, and as Marsh just said, it is a subject now which has attracted attention from scholars. So that a number of books have been written. One book you mentioned, Silver Men, but the others is a very good book written two or two or three years ago, The Canal Builders by Judy Green. And I if you're interested in, in, in the canal and all that went into it, not just the building of it, but its sort of importance in terms of emerging American foreign policy, both in this area and in the Pacific, well then of course it's essential reading. But okay. What I have then to say this morning will revolve around a number of questions and an attempt to answer those questions. So it is when, when did this migration take place? How many Barbadians in particular went to the Isthmus? Why did they go? What did they do in Panama? What impact, if any, did they have on their host country? And what impact did that migration have on Barbados? We I'm not sure that I'm going to have time to explore these in any depth, but of course, in the question and answer period, you can in fact quiz me. And um, I, should, I hope to have some answers for you. If I don't have the answers, I can tell you the literature that you can go to. Okay, so when? Put three. That migration took place from the 1880s. It started even before the 1880s with the building of a railroad across the isthmus, but it really got wide in a serious way when attempts were being made to construct a canal across the isthmus. So that key period was the first, say, the 1880s from 1881, when the first French company started to build a canal, and the second and main period will be 1904 when the United States took over the operation and built the canal. So between 1904 and 1930, that is when the bulk of Barbadians and other West Indians went off to Panama to work on the canal between 1904 and 1930. But I'm just saying as well that even before that, West Indians were there without West Indians have been recruited by the French Canal Company to help first with the railroad, building of the railroad, and secondly with the building of the tent at the building of the canal. So that's it. So there's two ways. So that's when that is the period that we're looking at. How many? It is difficult to be precise and Valva Newton and all, the, on, and all those others who have looked at the numbers recognize that there was a little difficulty. The difficulty has to do with, with, with this thing. One, the Canal Commission did recruit, they officially recruit workers. So you can call them the contract workers or the official migrants. So, and all of that is listed, you know, they, they kept books, so all of that is listed. So we can number those. And in fact, when you go and look at that, you will see from, from the Barbadian side that the total is about 1,300 in the early period and just under 20,000, just under 20,000 in the second period, okay? So that is the official thing. But all the indications are that the migration, the total migration from Barbados was probably three times as many of that. It was probably more like 60,000, but between 50 and 60,000. We say that, or rather, the people who have looked, people like Valdez and others, they say that 
because when they look at the statistics on the population of Barbados, you know, through the censuses, you can see the fall off in the population. So when you do the various calculations, you can get a sense, therefore, of, of how many people might have left. But you can do it in another way, which is unscientific, with, with anecdotal. What you know, again, and I can just tell my own story very quickly, most Barbadians have people who went to Panama. In my case, in my case, my grandfather went, my grandmother went, an aunt went, I believe, two great uncles went. So notice, however, what I can say. The, the one official migrant in that group of five or six was my grandfather. But he, but four or five others went along. Okay, so that what I'm saying then, when you come to total up, you have to take account of all of those who were the unofficial migrants. And the unofficial migrants were two sorts. One, the family, the families of the official migrants. And secondly, those who decided, though they did not get officially recruited, that they were going anyhow. <laughs> So and you, see, and you, you can understand why that is difficult to, to quantify because I mean, the, 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 the court didn't keep very good statistics, so you can't really track it. But as I said, when you look at all the other indications, particularly through the census figures, it is possible to suggest that there were there were many as 60,000, anywhere between 50 and 60,000 who left. That is clearly a very great exodus from our That's a huge exodus. Because it represented about one third, about one third of the population of Barbados at the time, over one third. So you can understand that, or why it was important. Quickly, let me just say, the indications are that most of them did not return, uh, and this is for a number of reasons. Some of them could not return because they died in Panama. It would, it would seem that about six thousand, seven, ten percent died, died in Panama. Some of the others settled in Panama. Again, it is difficult to say, but I think that we can start doing serious research about that to see whether we can come up with some estimates. But perhaps a majority, perhaps a majority of them continued on what you might regard as the immigration route. In other words, they used Panama once they stopped working on the canal to go on to other places. Some went to South America, some went to other parts of Central America, but some went to Cuba, but I think a very significant number went to North America, that is the Canada, and particularly the United States. So uh, this, is, this is basically what happened. Why did they leave in such large numbers is the next quick question. And again, the answer is very obvious. Panama offered opportunities which in fact they could not get or ever hope to get about it. And the reason for that, it is fairly simple. They live in a small, overcrowded, overcrowded island. You, you can move here now, you can see how overcrowded it is. And it was equally overcrowded there, one of the most overcrowded spots on the earth. You know, a population density of more than a thousand to the square mile. And what made it particularly awful for them at that time was that the economy is limping now, but it was virtually <laughs> at a standstill between say the 1880s and the 1920s and it was so because of course the, the island depended on the one shot sugar and sugar was a difficulty this is the period of an extended depression extended depression in the sugar industry and if therefore you are in that situation you can understand the consequences of it in terms of employment and wage levels so that therefore in Barbados was high unemployment Great deal of under employment, you know, people working three days a week, and of course, very, very low, very, very low wages. So, that therefore, when in fact these people are being offered under the contract, this is the contract workers, they were being offered anything between 80 cents and a dollar per day in guaranteed work in Panama. When you compare that with what they were lucky to get, they were lucky in Barbados, they might get three days work a week and they will probably get at most 20 cents or 24 cents per day. That is it. So when you, when you put, if, you, if you put it that way, you can immediately see why in fact they, they, they see a choice in fact. And you, 
there's a man who is born of Richardson and has written a book called Cut of My Money, and he managed to, as we went around by better, still find people talking, telling stories about the exodus, how the people, groups would move from district to district, telling, telling the fellow, come along, come along, I mean, this is not an opportunity to miss. And this is, in a sense, what they can happen. Okay, so, that they're flawed. But what now did they do in Panama? And um, we, will, we, will, we will start with, with the unofficials. Because the unofficials, in fact, were the bulk. Were the bulk of the Barbadians who went. You know, if my figures, if those figures stand up about 60,000, the only about 20,000 of them were the official, that is the contract workers. So you have to, you have to say something about the other 40,000 there were far from and I think that what has been, what we have managed to piece together, what the historians have managed to piece together, is that they behave like migrants in any country. In other words, they had a diversity of skill levels and they had strong motivation, as I have just been saying to you. So that, therefore, you would find that they, they looked around for whatever opportunities that they could make in order to ensure that what they had come for, they would get. So that you would perhaps find, therefore, a regular mobility among them as they move from job to job. You will see a lot of them, of course, working at things which, uh, for which they had no preparation, in the sense that they might have gone up there as skilled people, artisans. They might have gone up there even as teachers. But of course, given the circumstances, they could not, in fact, practice their skills. So you'll find a lot of them, in fact, um, becoming um, almost small farmers, growing produce, selling produce, in a sense, supplying all of those ancillary services which that big operation called the building of the canal um, requires. So, basically what I'm saying is that in a situation which, of course, particularly for you, most of you Americans, you would have heard a lot about frontier conditions. That is how you would describe the canal at that stage. But you, want, you can understand the range of services which was required. I'm saying that large 40,000 had to provide those services. But the contract workers, let's focus on them, because these are the silver men. These are the silver men. And these are the ones, of course, who would be brought, or brought to, to Panama to work on the canal, to build the canal. And it is obvious that they are provided mainly unskilled labor. Again, recognize that no matter what the skill level was when they left Barbados, they had been recruited, and this is what they did in Panama, basically unskilled labor. And the unskilled labor, obviously, you know what it would be, digging trenches with uh, menu roads. That is the sort of thing. The arduous, the very arduous activity, which was associated with they were called silver men. They were called silver men, as Morris said, because they were paid in silver, whereas the Americans, and that's the white Americans, not necessarily the black Americans, were paid in gold. Now we might also notice as well that there were other white workers, a lot of them recruited from Spain, for example. They were also silver workers. But even so, there was a fact distinction in terms of the level of pay between themselves and all the blacks who came from these Caribbean territories. Why, why gold and silver? It was more than just a difference in the type of currency. What it was, as you can understand, is the attempt to establish categories, clear categories of workers in other words, a form of segregation. So that it was not just pay. Facilities were denominated gold, facilities were denominated silver. So the superior facilities were gold and reserved for the gold employees. The inferior facilities, and they were provided, were denominated in silver, reserved, of course, for these, for these other workers. So that this and it was a tight fit, obviously a very tightly regimented system. So, that is the reason, therefore, why we have gold and silver, and one must might have followed as well. It, it naturally led to problems because.